Property Matters, the show that brings global trends to an Irish audience to help shape your knowledge of the industry. You can contact us on Twitter at iProperty Radio or by email at hello at iPropertyRadio.com. Your host today are myself, Brian Fox, and Carol Tallon. We have an exciting program. First up, Councillor Anne Colgan, Independent, Councillor Jim O'Leary, Finna Gale, both representing the Dundrum local electoral area, all sitting on Dundrum area, Ratdown County Council, and Shane O'Brien, Policy Officer of Sinn Fein, and previously a Councillor for his party on Dunleary Ratdown County Council. Um, during the week, the Irish Times carried a big article on the proposed development here in Dundrum. Since you both represent, and that's Jim and, and Anne, uh, represent the Dundrum electoral area, what was your reaction to this piece? There's a lot of talk now about it again. And we, we, I know we've talked about this before, but um, Anne, I just want to, you, you, um, you, you've you been on national radio in relation to this particular topic as well, I believe. Yeah, well, uh, the Imagine Dundrum community group that I chair has uh, invested a huge amount of time uh, in uh, raising awareness about this particular development and our serious concerns about it. And I mean, that article and, and uh, Jim's contribution to it uh, sums up uh, most of the kind of key concerns of the people of Dundrum. Yeah. You know, for east, west, north, south, the yeah. entire community, I think, is very, very upset about the possibility that this might go ahead because the general view is, that, you know, while we're all in favour of development and everyone wants to see that site developed, not in this way and uh, certainly not. In terms of the apartments and the size of apartments, etc. Well, that is one feature of it and, uh, you know, people tend to think that's the only thing that people get concerned about. But in this case, it's far from that. It's the totality of it. Um, the and size? It's the size, it's the things that the Dunleary at Down County Council planners have identified and flagged to onboard Planola when they recommended recently that it That's should right. be refused. That, that also they, one of the key things they, they talk about is the fact that the amount of residential provision on the site is completely out of kilter with its zoning, which is as a, as a major town centre, oh, which okay. requires a whole range of facilities for the people who will be living there as well as the people of Dundrum. Uh, that's what should be there, instead of which there's only 5% mixed uses. That's one thing. The treatment of the main street and the heritage buildings in the main street and the intent to um, demolish several buildings that are part of an architectural conservation area, the hi- height and size of buildings on the main street, which will completely overshadow the main street and turn it into a tunnel effectively. And then there is the density and height of the apartments uh, on the site itself. So, you know, where do you begin? Where do you end in terms of of <coughs> reservations about this? And they've been well flagged now by the Dunleary Down planners and by the by the local people and the councillors. And it is one of those developments. So you're all think, unified, really, around this. We're all of one mind. Of one yeah. mind, yeah. yeah. Now you have, uh, and I'll come to you in a moment, Jim. You have been, as I say, in discussion. What, what what are you hearing from people who um, don't necessarily go along with your objections to it? What what, what are they saying to you in relation? to wanting to go forward with, with the um, with the construction? Well, uh, we've knocked on an awful lot of doors in the run up to this. And I think I met one person who said we need housing. That that would be the kind of uh, response, that, you know, we need housing. But they forget to locate that, you know, yeah. housing. It's not enough to have four walls. Yeah. You need the facility, the neighbourhood, the community. And then you get the stock nimbyism uh, kind of accusation, uh, but not in our backyard. It's not in my backyard, uh, but I absolutely uh, resist this development. And thousands of people have put in submissions. There were 700 submissions. Seven of them were from resident associations representing thousands yeah, of people. Yeah, yeah. It's not in their backyard either. Uh-huh. What they are concerned about is what is going to happen to the village of Dundrum, which is going to become a new town in effect. So it needs the kinds of facilities and it needs the kind of development that's sympathetic to a modern urban village and a 400 year old uh, village, you know, and we believe you can have that. Mm. You can have your cake and eat it. Mm. It doesn't have mm. to be this monstrosity. So just bring Jim in. I will bring in Jim in a moment. Uh, you know, from from one could, uh, from people, from Someone from outside of the of the area could say, come on, guys, you're far too conservative. You know, this could be a fantastic new challenge for you. You have to look forward. You have to look with some sort of vision. And it's described there in quite detail the problems you're having. But perhaps this could be a, a very good thing when, when, when on the whole, it's, it's, it's looked at. Um, 
I think some of the accusations being levelled both at the local community and the councillors are very unfair. And what I'll hang my hat on is that the independent professional planners of Dunleary Ratdown have recommended that it be refused planning permission. And that's because we have a plan. Now, we either believe in the plan, which is effectively, while it's the decision of councillors, it's, it's, it's created, formed by professional planners. And we've identified Dundrum for the last 20 years as a metropolitan town. A metropolitan town has certain functions. The zoning is mixed. If you bring forward a proposition that's 95% of one type of uh, uh, use, then you're not producing a mixed development, which is what we require. So if they had come forward and said it's going to be 95% uh, offices, I would have opposed that too. But something that's more balanced, that has offices, that addresses issues of leisure, that addresses issues of supporting an increasing community. And this whole idea that um, it's all about housing, we need housing. I think as well what we need to recognise is between the Ballantyre Road and the Goldstown Road, there are two and a half thousand planning units with, in the pipeline, if you like, right? And you have a thousand student beds. So there's a huge quantum of development anticipated and expected. And I'm quite happy to stand over the fact that I signed off on a county development plan that looks, that does look for, for higher densities, does look for compact growth, does look for, for, for height in, in certain, in, in certain areas where, where the planners themselves specifically determine that's suitable, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The planners here have said that this is the wrong application on the wrong site. Now, so, so it's got nothing to do with Jim O'Leary and any accusations of prejudice people might have in terms of my position. It's got to do with professional, qualified planners saying this is a bad application. It's contrary to our plan. Our plan is, 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 is a, an integrated, cohesive approach for the whole county and in particular for providing services for this, uh, this area of the county. This is going to be the second town in the county. And we undermine that plan if... On the last big site in the Dundrum area, uh, in the Dundrum village area, if you like, is exclusively uh, residential. Right. So is, is it a case now of, of you being deadlocked down between um, councillors, council and, um, and and residents in relation to this? Um, and of course, the developers as well. Uh, Hammerson, I think, are the... Hammerson and Allianz. Yeah. Allianz, yeah. 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 Well, so, it's down to on board Planola now at this stage. Uh, and it's in, it's in their hands. And we can only hope that they will, as Jim said, be... Uh, will take very seriously 126 page analysis by the professional planners in Dunleary at Down and under virtually every heading that they looked at this development they said it should be refused on those grounds so it would be extraordinary yeah. My, my, my last question before I do hand over to Shane is um yeah, you've, you've both presented a very good case uh, this morning here in relation to to the problems uh, for but um do you feel then um, that but people outside of the area aren't listening to you or they don't... They don't. I think it's fallen into this argument of uh, this is good simply because it's housing. And we all recognise there's a housing crisis and housing is important. But it's, it's in, so, in, in it's, this example... It's mono thing, sort of thinking, it, is that what you're trying precisely, to Precisely. We have two and a half thousand housing units in mm. the pipeline mm. for this part mm. of, the t of, of the county. Mm. In, in fact, a very narrow part mm. of the county, not even the full Dundrum area. Two and a half thousand. So you so, value a town as opposed to a housing estate. So, such. so the point being, the housing has been used as an excuse to try and contravene what is a well thought out cohesive plan. Mm -hmm. And it's not like we don't have a huge amount of housing in the pipeline for this specific area between the Ballantyre Road and the Goldstown Road, two and a half thousand units. In the whole of Dun Dunleary right down, I think it could be 18,000 units have planning permission waiting to be executed by developers. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not correct for them to say, uh, being against this, this is nimbyism, you know, with a housing crisis should be allowed. I'm happy as a councillor that our council is doing what it is, is stepping up to the plate and doing what it needs to do. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I would, the point I would make is that our uh, county development plan now is fully aligned with mm -hmm. national regulations. So no one can say that we're trying okay. to hide behind restrictions. And, and is there anything you want to add to what Jim has said there before? Brad, well, just to, before you go to Shane there, uh, I think, I mean, I suppose it might be implied in your question that there is another view, that there's a substantial other cohort of of, of opinion well, out there. And yeah. in my view, there isn't. Uh, I've looked at those 704 uh, submissions and I think I came across three that were supportive, apart from Irish Water, who doesn't say anything except technical stuff, that were supportive of this mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the 
vast bulk of people and the ethos of the community is is no, mm. you know, the only mm. people, in my view, supporting this are Hammers and Allianz. Mm -hmm. So what do you expect? Well, I suppose, <laughs> generally speaking, what are the um, timelines for a board to, to, uh, to well, uh, respond? A decision is due on the 25th of July, but the common wisdom is because there's such a, a backlog of strategic housing developments to be judged upon that it may run into August. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're having their... their Jane, your reaction yeah. to what you've heard from the two no, councillors in, in the area? Far, I suppose kicking off with a public meeting, which you said a couple of hundred residents attend to. And uh, I know our rep in the area, Sean Tracy, had made a submission and it's very much matches what both Anne and have Jim have said there. I, I haven't come across anyone who said this area shouldn't be developed. Mm -hmm. But people are saying, what is the type of development that we need? Mm -hmm. And I know Anne, through her work and long-standing work with Imagine Dundrum, had really put out a clear vision of what that kind of town, what the village and what the town, a potential met metropolitan town could look like. And this flies in the face of that. Uh, and then going back to Jim's point on the, on the county development plan, like the county development plan is a contract. That's basically what a county development plan is. It's a contract between communities, between the people living in an area, working in an area and its local authority. Mm -hmm. And again, this flies in the face of that contract. Mm -hmm. So you would question what's the point of doing doing county development plans mm -hmm. or local area plans um, if on board Panola don't recognise all of the serious concerns that the planners in Dunley right down have, that the councillors have, that other groups representing, whether residents associations or otherwise in the area have. Uh, and I just... I would, Do you think I would be very mismatch? surprised. The only, the only alternative view, and I think it is an important point that you've made is, is there other, I haven't heard an alternative view from anyone living, representing this area. Mm -hmm. um, you see it in commentary in terms of on social media, in commentary relating to news articles where people do say, oh, this is just NIMBYism, we need housing. But, but on that it, point it though, Shane, do you think from what we're hearing from our, pa our panelists here, that the, the broader community isn't hearing what we've heard this morning in terms of it being a new, a new town. I'm hearing it being a new town completely as opposed to a housing development per se. So is that, is that message do you think not getting out? That's actually maybe a good point, but I, 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 I think people, yes, are looking at how will it impact things as they are. Yeah. and not possibly what Dundrum will be into the future. Yeah. But Dundrum has seen massive changes in the last 20 years. Where we're sitting today is, yeah. uh, I think, tantamount to that, you know, the, the town centre itself yeah. uh, and Dundrum's transformation from a, a small village. And we go back even further in time where it was almost the outpost of, mm. of Dublin County for, for a long, long time. Um, but there is a lot of development planned, even just down the road, the Central Mental Hospital and other areas along Goatstown Road. Uh, and I do think it comes down to the type of development mm. that is being proposed. And it is out of kilter uh, with local needs and in terms of the mix of what is being proposed also is, is problematic. Um, and although you do have excellent transport links in terms of the Lewis and things like that, they have a capacity. And there's also, you know, in terms of the road networks, getting up even here this morning, you will know sitting in traffic and congestion. Yeah. There are issues that will come yeah. from what's being proposed. And, and simply just looking at some of the, you know, the, the, the simulations that have been made and the projections in terms of the height and the, the shadowing, I think Hans Point put it well, you know, main, the main street of Dundrum will become almost like a dark tunnel all year round. Mm. And that isn't good for anyone. Okay. I want to move on because Michael McDowell had a very interesting op-ed in the Irish Times this week. He was writing on the topic of, of directly elected mayors for local authorities and wrote about a plan for legislation for Dems, which is short, obviously, for um, democratically elected uh, mayors. Uh, the, uh, the plan is called um, an, an Implementation Advisory Group uh, chaired by uh, Tom O'Connor. So I just read a bit from it because I just picked some interesting pieces out. Mm. Uh, an Implementation, yes, has produced a very impressive plan for legislation for the election of a DEM for a five-year term from 2024 to 2029. That has to do with Limerick, of course. Mm -hmm. um, the area of competence proposed to Limerick them are huge in scale. I'll just move on. Perhaps we should consider making the council, the, the office of council's chief executive officers less permanent and powerful by providing that is held at the pleasure of the elected members are a qualified majority of them. That could be done in tandem with the extension of dams across our system of uh, councils. And finally, <clears throat> before I go back to the panel, if dams are going to be leaders of their local authorities, they need to tackle the housing crisis, back again to the housing crisis. If you open a legal textbook on the Irish local, on the Irish local government, you'll see an elaborate provision in statute for the discharge by local authorities of functions uh, on planning authorities and housing authorities. They have a legal duty to plan and provide for adequate pl housing uh, under the Planning and Development Acts and the, hum and the uh, Housing Acts. So, Jim, I'll turn to you. Um, wh what's your reaction to what you've heard? I don't know if you've read that particular piece um, in, in relation to it. It's actually an area I'm very interested in, but I think 
part of the problem we focused on this idea of the mayor being elected. And that's a sideshow. What's important is how much democracy or how much powers are we prepared to Turn delegate over, yeah. to the local area, yeah. whether it's authority that a county manager has, uh, authority that councils have, uh, authority that a mayor has. Now, you mentioned a report there in Nimerick, and what's very interesting about it is that at, at a high level, my understanding is that the powers of county councillors, someone like myself or Anne, and maybe Shane again, won't change. We'll continue to have reserve powers. But the idea is that we'll have this directly elected mayor and he will assume the powers of the county development manager. So the county development manager now will really only have an administrative role, looking at things like finance and HR. But there will be more powers handed down from central government to this directly elected mayor. <clears throat> now, what's important, I think, is from a lo- as a councillor, we as councillors will, will, will retain control over the budgeting process in terms of it, us having to decide it. We'll also have the power to remove a directly elected mayor if Tim O'Connor's report is adopted as, as the model going forward. Um, and I think the other very important thing is how do we fund our local authorities? So one of the things they're proposing is that instead of a local authority being given a block grant every year, it will be multi-annual. So that would allow you to plan strategically. Now, you don't have to have a directly elected mayor to do that immediately. And it would make it easier for the people who are running local government to be able to plan three years out in terms of current funding. So there's lots of good proposals in it. Um, personally, I have concerns about the idea of a directly elected mayor. I think it generates a winner's take a winner takes all uh, type of competition. And you see the flaw in that mechanism if you look at America. Uh, you are either going so someone like Donald Trump could become president of America. And he doesn't represent and never will represent or even try to represent all Americans. And similarly in France, you have an unpopular president in Macron only because he's not as unpopular or seen as dangerous as Le Pen, Marie Le Pen. So I prefer the idea maybe of you would have a, a, a like in places like Germany or in Ireland, you have multi-party groupings formed. So, and, and these groupings can change. And similarly, if you look at the UK, it's a winner-takes-all process. Well, and the Tories... Yeah, but if you, if you look at London, uh, Shane, just bringing you in, you've got, a very, you've got a very popular mayor there at the moment. Yeah, but that's like comparing apples and oranges, Brian. Um, what we first really need to recognise, and I think McDowell says it in his piece there, we don't really have local government in Ireland. We have local administration of the Department of Local Government. Um, the, the issue in terms of Limerick obviously it was put to a plebiscite at the last local yeah. elections and it was a very narrow majority and a very narrow win but it, but people did endorse the concept it was supposed to be yes, yeah, yeah, elections yeah. for that mayoral mayoral elections at the end of this year and um, I've been following the pre-legislative scrutiny of the the, Dim- the Limerick directly elected mayoral bill which is very much stalled and um, a lot of the proponents and people who are campaigning for a directly elected mayor actually feel that the legislation itself doesn't reflect what the promises and the ideas that were put out there as part of that campaign to encourage people. Um, we've also at the same time Waterford rejected uh, the concept uh, at its at its plebiscite at the local last local elections and similarly in Cork. I know there has been calls for a directly elected mayor in Gal- in in Galway. Uh, the council passed a unanimous motion there last year, and similarly, obviously, there's a citizens assembly now running for the Dublin city Dublin local authority areas. Uh, That's just for the Dublin, that's okay, yeah. Um, but, but I think it's it's a bit of a sideshow, uh, to be honest with you, and it's, it's, it's missing the point because, for example, we have so many issues with, within local government itself. Jim, you pointed to some of the lack of multi-annual funding, lack of planning, the, the powers, you know, in terms of how they're stacked in favour of a chief executive versus those who are democratically elected. Uh, and while it is welcome that, you know, it's said that no count powers will be taken from councillors, there hasn't been any clear indication what powers would come from central government and not just central government because actually central government has devolved some of its powers and functions to various agencies, whether to be the NTA or the HSC or Department you know, Education Trust, CTB, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it, the framework and what's been actually planned is, is, is very unclear. And, in, and, and that, that, that lack of clarity really means that the debate that is happening around this is very superficial. Okay. Uh, and I do believe that, you know, talking about local government reform by putting in a figurehead while actually not fixing the foundations and, and making the foundations right is only going to lead for, you know, okay. for future failure of that directly elected mayor. And you were, when you were in the last time on this, on this topic, you were very much against it. You're still, yes, yeah. I can, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I would agree absolutely with my colleagues here. Uh, I think the thing that comes to mind is this is putting icing on a half-baked cake, you know. Um, so you don't necessarily then agree with what Michael McDowell had to say. Yeah, but he's accepting the premise. 
you know, and talking about how does it work. The premise is flawed. The concept is flawed. I mean, I, and I think uh, Jim raised there the specter of Americanization of Irish local government, where you politicize the executive function. And people are being just drawn into this notion of directly elected. And as Jim said, that's a side show. You know, you get a vote every five years, but what you're voting for is actually to um, politicize the executive function. And I don't agree with that. I think the executive function and the political control of the executive function, there should be clear blue water between the two of them. And what it is doing is blurring that that boundary. And I think it's really bad. And what really bothers me a lot is the fact that in Waterford and in Limerick and in the, was it Cork? Uh, Cork Cork was the third base. They got a say, the people got a say in whether they wanted to have a directly elected mayor or not. The word that, the note that went out in relation to the Citizens' Assembly for this one wasn't uh, putting it in that context, it was saying, what kind of directly elected mayor do you want? It was assuming that government was going to impose this without giving us a say. Mm-hmm. And I, I have a concern about that. I, I think what has been said here about the debate being uh, superficial because the vast majority of people don't understand what's in, involved. But my understanding of, you know, informally is that government departments were asked what would they hand over to uh, the local authority in Limerick? And there was a big nothing, you know. So if nothing gets handed over in terms of powers mm-hmm. uh, to the to local government, so you know, before, what are we at? But before we do go to a break, I'm just curious because we have uh, obviously around the table here, you're all you're you're not in favour of court. Anybody in 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 the council uh, that would be in favour of it? We haven't had an opportunity to discuss it, and okay. that's another flaw in the. Okay. Can, I, can I just say, Brian? I, Briefly, I, I'm against what is being proposed in terms of, or how it's being proposed and how it's evolving. That's not to say that there might not be uh, the potential for having directly elected mayors. Yeah. But when you're only having the debate focus on a potential figurehead and not local government as a whole, you're you're so missing you're missing the point. The whole thing needs to be broadened out. It needs to be looked at in the realms of local realm. government reform. Uh, okay. And even in looking at it from a Dublin perspective, and I suppose we're Very you know good. from Dublin, you know what does that mean? Are we going to have local government reform for Dublin and not the, and not the rest of the okay. country? So that's 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 my issues that I would have. Ninety three point nine, Dublin South FM. And welcome back to I Property Radio with Brian Fox and myself, Carol Tallon. You can contact us on social media at I Property Radio or email hello at iPropertyRadio.com. Now, in the hot or the PropTech hot seat today is Adam Ferguson, Chief Commercial Officer of DAF.ie, part of Distilled. Adam, we've been dying to get you into the PropTech hot seat for weeks. Thank you so much for joining us. Delighted to be here. Thanks a million for the invite. Um, I think it was always built to be in the hot seat, so I'm happy with that. <laughs> Very good. Well, that's what we like to hear. So, Adam, I don't think there's many in our audience that wouldn't be familiar with DAFT as one of the leading property portals in Ireland. But um, for anyone uninitiated, you might just explain the DAF.ie offering. Yeah, so we're a, uh, depends how you describe it, we're a property portal, effectively a web-based portal to help people find uh, houses for sale and rent and to help uh, estate agents primarily, but also secondarily vendors, etc., to advertise their properties for sale. So we aggregate supply and we aggregate demand, as well as doing other things since, but that's our primary function. Um, DAF.ie certainly was one of the key reports uh, that people in the industry would have been relying on for, gosh, well over a decade now. The market has changed a lot and there's almost a sense of, I, I don't say for boarding, but uh, for boarding, but there's certainly a familiarity from anybody who was in the marketplace kind of 15 years ago now. How, from your latest market insights, looking only, say, at the residential market, what kind of trends are you picking up on at the moment? So. You know, we probably, the estate agents probably see it first, any changes in the market around demand, but we're still seeing a huge imbalance between demand and supply. Um, There might be some cooling and growth, but there's still growth. So, you know, the headlines are still very similar, albeit the, you know, the want is for a change in the market. I think interest rates are going to impact things. Um. People are going to, that's going to impact borrowing. We did some analysis on the DAF mortgages side recently to look at the percentage of people who would be impacted by affordability outside of the three and a half times limit if interest rates were to increase. And depending on the volume, you increase interest rates by the demand drops. Um, And that's going to impact new homes demand at some point. But we haven't seen it. Year to date, 
We've had 70,000 leads in new homes. Um, look, I'm, I'm not the only commentator to say that we need 35,000 new homes um, annually. We're nowhere close to that. That's causing lots of stress, um, huge stress for first-time buyers. Um, I wouldn't like to be a first-time buyer in this market. I think it's re really, really, really difficult. Um, related to that, and, and you know, lots of your listeners will know this, planning permission is a problem. Judicial reviews, infrastructure, but you know, the not in my backyard objections are causing a huge problem from a volume perspective in the short term. I, you know, I, I really love the concept of yes in my back yard yeah. by, uh, you know, Carl Dieter put in a, a observation on a development near his house that was going to impact him. Um, but he's pro development because he knows we have a housing crisis. Um, and I think there needs to be more of that publicized and people need to be more willing to stand up and say, yes, we need these houses, regardless of impacts from local residents. Um, nothing comes for free. Everybody has to compromise to, to, to help us resolve this. Uh, it's going to take more. So that's planning. That's short term. Yeah. If you look yeah. long term, and I think of the example of Cherrywood, 20 years ago, it was set up as an SDZ, so a strategic development zone. The first residential, first person to move in will be in the next, if it hasn't been the last few weeks, is, is, is now. So it's taken 20 years from inception to delivery. And where's the next Cherrywood? You know, that's, that's, not, that's still only a portion of the number of houses we need in any one given year. The Lewis line was built in 2004. Up until last year, there was cows grazing in Lawnstone right next to it. It doesn't happen overnight. And the foresight needed, and I don't envy the government, this isn't an easy task, but the foresight needed on zoning and future infrastructural development, be that Irish water, be it transport, or all of the above, is huge. You so, know, Adam, I, there's there's an awful lot there to, to unpack in what you're saying. And, yeah. and look, you're absolutely right. But let's let's start with the things maybe that might be of immediate concern. So say in terms of... Um, the mortgage stress stress test we're seeing in the UK uh, a slackening of this, whereby uh, home buyers are not going to be required to be stress tested in terms of their mortgages. We still have much tighter controls here in Ireland, and it doesn't look like they're going away anytime soon. Which obviously is a good thing because this is a, this is the lesson that we've learned from the crash. But in terms of our macro prudential rules, you know, the fact that we're still limiting at three and a half times a borrower salary, when we know across the Eurozone, it's more likely to be four and a half times, which is still considered um, conservative. Are the Irish mortgages or mortgage lending, is that too conservative for the current marketplace? I mean, it's a different situation, but I, I, I was a small time property developer in 2006 and seven and eight. And, you know, I personally felt the brunt of this. I know lots of people with what happened where people are overextended from a residential mortgage and, and from a you know, business perspective with borrowing. It's not a healthy thing to happen. So we need to be very careful. And interest rates are going to increase. Um, and if you don't stress test in that environment, then that's a straight up mistake, I think, because affordability will be affected. And we need sustainable solutions and we don't need people pressed for with energy costs and they're not able to afford their mortgages either. Now, I spoke to someone recently about what happened in the 70s and late 70s and early 80s. And, you know, the banks had to do deals where you pay, say, your interest is 15 percent. You were paying 10 percent and your mortgage was going up by 5 percent per annum. So that's very difficult. I, I think we need to be very careful. Um, and I think that comes down to government intervention around subsidizing the, the construction of houses. It's not about putting stacks of personal debt on people. It's about building houses. And there's more ways to do that than allow people to borrow as much money as they can or borrow more money. I'm not saying that you said to go to, to four and a half times, but making affordable mortgages and maybe we need affordable property and we need, we need intervention that allows for cost-effective development. The price of construction materials has gone through you know, it's gone, it's gone crazy and, and there's going to be greater inflation. And I think we may need government intervention in a way that gives us housing. You know, um, it's, it's, I'm really delighted that you've actually positioned it as that, because, you know, if we had a politician in that seat, they would not be able to say it like that. They would have to talk about incentivizing home buyers, first time buyers, uh, people returning um, or people looking for a fresh start. Essentially, it is only politically palatable to talk about incentivizing buyers when actually 
we know what's needed is on the supply side. I mean, you've referenced a figure there of 35,000 per year, but I know Ronan Lyons um, routinely would talk about 50,000 new homes needed per year for the foreseeable. And in fact, uh, Sherry Fitzgerald's um, Marion Finnegan recently ramped that up and said, actually, you know, we could be looking at a figure from 50 to 60,000 needed annually per year. And that's the highest I've heard a commentator in, in the marketplace talk about it. But there's, it takes a lot of political bravery to come out and say, um, home builders build homes. Local authorities actually are depending on local home builders. So whether you call them property developers or home builders, the reality is they are physically building homes. They're the people who actually need that, that um, form of incentive. And not just in terms of incentive to make it profitable, but at this point, incentive to make it viable. It's just not politically palatable to do that. And so actually what we're looking at on the supply side is a lack of political bravery causing a problem. Do you see that that's likely to change? So I, I prefer not to comment too, uh, to provide political commentary too, 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 too much, but it, you know, it's always very difficult. You, you, if you want to be successful in politics, you have to win the next election. Um, and I, but I think we need longer term views and foresight here to solve this problem because it's a big problem. And you're right, it's, it's, it's much more, inter it's 35,000 homes just to get to the, the year on year population increase. We already have a cramming issue. We have way more people per unit than anyone else in Europe, um, at least way more than the average in Europe. And we've, this, you know, we've been doing 15,000 houses a year for a number of years when we needed 35,000. So we have a whole load of pent up demand. Um, and I think... Now, you know, if you, if you, I, I think about the rental space quite a lot. And if you think about the mom and pop landlord and the institutional investor, we need social housing as well. But if you take those three segments, they're, they're the three groupings that are going to help solve the rental crisis. The mom and pop landlord and the institutional developer or, or investor needs a profit. There is no other way that they're going to operate in that space. And if you take you know, a much more palatable from a political perspective, the mom and pop landlord. We know that the PRS is seen as, you know, someone who shouldn't make profit and who's taking and not supplying. But I, I, I feel very, very genuinely that they've offered a lot of supply. And now it's possible, you know, for, for our staff in Daft, for example, to get accommodation in Dublin, they are, they're using the, the built to rent solutions and they're very good and they're, and they're you know, high quality, purpose built um, you know, the reason they're not affordable is because there's not enough of them. And if there was more, you know, I'm, I'm an advocate of supply and basic economic concepts, which is supply and demand. And if we could get more supply into the market, but to take a more palatable grouping, which is the mom and pop landlord, um, they need to be incentivized. If they're not incentivized, it's a, you know, it's a lot of hassle. The red tape's increasing. You know, I was speaking to an agent the other day about the, the RTB requirements and their system and everything. The red tape is increasing as a private landlord. You know, your, your, your tenants' rights are increased. We've all heard the horrific stories of, of poor quality tenants, albeit in most cases, tenants are exceptional and really good. Um, but the, the landlord needs to be protected. The landlord needs to make money. They're taxed out of it. You know, anyone who's middle-class owner of a, prop, a rental property is paying 50-odd tax, percent tax. You know, renovations are expensive, maintaining to the quality that people need to keep energy costs down. I mean lots of those properties are going to need significant retrofits and upgrading. Who's going to pay for that? That's, the, you know, the, the, the landlord's not making enough money. Yeah, um, the private, I think the private landlord one is, a, a, it's, it's almost a conversation that's just coming to a head because only in, in the most recent, uh, in, the, in the recent weeks, we know that there are plans under consideration for um, tax incentives for private landlords. And this is essentially to stop the mass exodus from the market that we've been seeing since about 2017, 2018. And I know the most recent uh, REA um, house price sentiment uh, survey, they, they certainly spoke about, I, I think 32% of secondhand homes coming to the market now being brought by exiting landlords. So, yeah. so there's, there's almost two separate issues there. It's to stop the flow of existing private landlords out of the market. And then second to that, to incentivize new private landlords into the market. And we seem to be doing a bad job on both fronts. Yeah, but we don't have enough supply. So, so regardless, you know, the first time buyer, this impacts then the first time buyer. And this has become a real political football, you know. Is it, is, it, is it rental versus sales? And depending on the audience at the time, people are, you know, there's influencers in social media who would be very orientated towards the sales space. And then at the same time, throwing out, you know, 
challenges on the on the rentals side. So more stock everywhere is really important. And what you'd like to see is, you know, back in back in the the last 15, 20 years, if you talk to a developer who was developing 10 years ago, they'll tell you that look, investors came in and bought 10 to 20% of my stock and rented it out. And they bought the houses on the corners that the 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 first time buyers didn't want or the family homes that, that weren't wanted as family homes mm-hmm. um, from a principal primary residence perspective. And that's just not happening. And if we had more supply, if we had lower construction costs, which, you know, there maybe maybe that's a dream, but I think the government can influence these things. And if we had more stock that's affordable, then and a tax regime that worked for landlords, then first time buyers would be able to buy houses and landlords would be able to buy houses. And that's what we need. You know, in terms um, of new supply, one of the other things that you touched on earlier was around NIMBYism, this not in my backyard concept. And there are a few initiatives popping up here, but there's an excellent one in London and um, it's called uh, London YIMBY. So it's essentially trying to educate homeowners in London um, about the benefits of allowing development on their street. Um, so because there's this, this, this concern, people trying to protect what they have already, But, you know, one part of it was education, but the second part was shared benefit. So how can people who are living on a street benefit if they allow or don't don't object to uh, developments coming in on their street where there is space for it? Because the same concerns are always given. It's always given. Nobody thinks they're objecting on grounds of not in my backyard. People are genuine when they are when they talk about their concerns about traffic flow and school places and, and all of these other things, including environmental concerns. So I, I do believe that homeowners are genuine when they talk about that. The reality is it still amounts to we need homes, just not in my backyard. So there's an education process, but how can we how can we help people to get the benefits within their community of doing this? So is like is that something that DAF.ie, is this something that you've considered? Do you have a role to play in this? I, I, I don't know if we have a role, um, but we do have an opinion, whether that's, uh, or I certainly have an opinion. Um, if you take, you know, for example, I, I, I lived near Cherrywood previously, and, you know, the creation of the Lewis stop was a huge benefit to me. A creation of a school, there was creches that were built before the development opened, so you know, there was good quality creches that were really, really accessible um, with good parking facilities because the development hadn't started um, and, and right next to Lewis. So you could, you know, drop your kid, jump on the Lewis and, and go into town and, and, and go to work. So all of those facilities that came with the, the development of Cherrywood was, were really significant to local residences and had lots of value. If you combine that um, with schools, but they definitely weren't achieved in one political cycle, which no. brings us back to everybody needing. Do you know, it, it, it dawns on me, or like I, I'm reminded of that old phrase, um, is it that society grows great when all men plant trees that they won't ever, under whose shade they, they won't ever sit. Um, and placemaking is a little like that. We need everybody to be forward thinking for the next generation. And that's something maybe that, that isn't happening at the moment. But Adam, I'm conscious of time and I'm conscious of, of controlling what's in the controllable, seeing, solving f- what, what might actually um, be within the realms to solve here. So but on the of, topic of trees, oh yes. it, is, it is the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. And the next best, best time to plant a tree is now. And, you know, there needs to be movement really fast. Mm-hmm. or else we won't solve the problem for the future. And we can kick it down the road for as long as we like. But if we don't get supply significantly up and plant those trees today, we won't be in a place that fixes this problem for But, but how, how crazy is it that we're not actually even saying uh, we need people to plant the trees? What we're really saying is we need people to stop objecting to trees being planted. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. you know it, it is ridiculous when you turn it on its head like that but look there's a huge education role like genuinely I don't blame uh, the communities in this instance I genuinely believe the industry has not done a good enough job in communicating plans in and, and in making sure that the existing communities benefit from the development which we know they will you've just referenced it in Cherrywood we know they will but tell them show them how so there's an education process that needs to happen but it needs to be more collaborative as opposed to tick box um but, you, you know, the, again, um, there, that almost feels like a larger problem for another day. Let's take it back a step maybe to some of the things that 
uh, yourself and the team within DAP.ie are doing to actually streamline this process to, you know, some of the digital tools? Because again, you're sitting in the prop tech hot seat today. We want to know about the technology that you're doing that's actually making Ireland's property property uh, system, um, if not necessarily the marketplace flow. So we are distilled, we're daft and dealing and advert study and our mission is to make better buying, selling and renting for everyone in Ireland. So what that means is, you know, that includes all of the stakeholders, includes agents, vendors, buyers in the case of property sales, which is the most topical here today. What we've seen recently is a really strong increase and we see the role of technology like our technology. You know, you can you can search for a property, send a lead to an agent 24-7. So, you know, what we've seen is from talking to customers is that, you know, most properties are bought by couples. So someone and their partner, two partners get together, they discuss it outside of our work hours. And, you know, decisions are made not in nine to five and conversations and communications with agents are now happening more and more outside of office hours. And that's really difficult for agents. Um, and it's, it's costly from a, a human resource perspective. And we believe that technology should resolve this and create the 24 seven experience that's really um, interactive. So, you know, I take an example, I was, I was bidding on a house a few years ago and, you know, I'd be in and out of meetings all day and I played phone tennis with the agent. And then I, you know, get on the Lewis at six o'clock and try to make the call and then, and the office is closed. And I know that day there's been three or four bids and that's really frustrating. So our most recent tool in that space is, is offers by Daft. And, you know, we're seeing, that 33% of bids are made outside of ours. Now, you know, some agents say, I don't, I don't want to engage with a tool like this because it's, um, it's effectively taking away the personal touch. Um, and our argument to that, we'll call it of sorts, is that you still need the personal touch in that you should understand exactly who the bidder is. And, you know, from the vendor's perspective, that's really important because, you know, there's time wasters, there's people who don't have funding in place, there's people who have the wrong intention. I, I, I always love the story of one of our product managers moved from the UK and an estate agent showed him a house in um, Kildare and he was, he, he, he was looking to bid on it. And they were really, really uncomfortable that his partner hadn't seen the property, you know, accepting a bid from somebody who, who, who both parties haven't seen it, it's difficult. And that nuance is really important on the estate agent side. but if I want to make a bid at one o'clock in the morning because I've finished work and I happen to work as a chef, um, I should be able to do that and then not have to, to, you know, if there's three or four bidders in a house and there's 30 or 40 bids, that's hundreds and hundreds, that's hundreds of phone calls that have to happen and there's no efficiency for anybody because I think later in the chain, the conversation is now it's at X, it's not a, it's not a Y anymore. Um, and, you know, there's mistrust because people feel like it's not transparent. They don't see all of the bits there. We think the technology can really solve that and make the agent look good and make the agent really efficient. Um, Adam, so, are you still are you still come up against resistance from agents now? Because I mean, I, I feel like online bidding is something that was introduced um, not just for for auction but for private treaty prior to COVID. But during COVID. You know, when people became so much more familiar with the tools, I mean, both kind of the consumers, but also the agents, um, because I think that actually PropTech has shown us that the innovation in the early days was very much consumer led and the agents yeah. had to get on board. Whereas I can see a shift in that now and I can see the agents really understanding the advantages that technology brings. And so they're, they've really, it, to my mind, kind of grabbed and run. So they're, they're no, no longer being led by consumers. Now they're actually um, preempting consumers' needs, which is where we needed them to get to. But are you still now? Po I, I can't, we can't say post COVID, but post the, the two years of restrictions and all that we've had, are you still meeting resistance? Oh yeah, you like there's always early adopters, um, and you know we're seeing it in um, we're seeing the agents who adopted absolutely love it. It saves them loads of time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really efficient. They say the buyers are really happy. The vendors are really happy. It, you know, everybody has transparency in real time and people demand it real time. You know, the vendor wants to know what's going on all the time and it's ringing the agents. The agents trying to take calls and bids. And this is a lot of, lot of work. And it was agent led. So, you know, an agent described the problem to us and said, look, this is, this is where I think the space is going to get resolved. And I think your platform's best because it's got the eyes as well. And everybody yeah. can easily access it and see it quickly. But but there's there's traditional agents that aren't early adopters. And, you know, a lot of credit to what they value because local knowledge, local communication, 
and relationships with people, trust. These are all really core strengths of what an agent is. And, you know, so credit to those agents. I think I think there's a balance in how they utilize and how they how they use technology. But some of those strengths are really valuable when it comes to being an estate agent. So, I, look, I think yeah. I think the consumer led will win. Competitors will do it, so they'll do it. And it, I, I, I think the future is all private treaty bidding will happen online. And it's not that far away. I yeah, think no, that's no, I, 12 months time, I think you're going to see it. Almost all houses will be. Will yeah. Be yeah, no, look, absolutely. Bidding. And uh, any of the innovators we've spoken to, people who are doing um, a standalone online bidding sites would certainly say the same. Although I, I think their figures for bids outside of office hours would possibly exceed kind of 33%. They think a lot of bidding happens in the evening time. So people are off work and, and in a position to think about it. But you're absolutely right. This is changing. But um, it occurs to me really that dot.ie, yourself and the team, you're serving a lot of masters. Does that get confusing in terms of conflict? Because obviously you the people who are uh, benefiting, the consumers who are benefiting from ask, accessing your services, but then there's the, your client base, the people who are paying to put the information there. You know, does this, does this give rise to conflict when you're, again, just serving so many masters across the transaction? I mean, I think that, analogy of the chicken and egg is so famous for for a reason you know like we have strength that we aggregate all of the demand and we have a strength that we aggregate all of the supply um and trying to satisfy both in a really good manner um can be challenging now consumers want 24 7 responses you know there's examples of difficulty on the consumer side at the moment where not getting a response from an agent is the greatest frustration from an agent or an advertiser of any sorts in rent, because it's impossible, particularly private private actually rental as well is a big problem. It's, it's a, if you get if you put an ad on that for a rental property and you get two hundred inquiries in two days, unless you have the right tooling, you're not able to go back to these customers, and so that's a frustration then that makes the supply side or you know the advertiser look bad, but but in a way it's our fault because we haven't solved the problem for the, the advertisers. So now we're looking at tools like an automated bulk response that says, you know, we're having viewings on this date. You can, you know, with your own branding, customize that response. And those types of tools, you know, arguably we've come too slowly with them. Yeah. They'll make a better experience for both sides. And I think we should, if, we're, if, we're, if we do it right, and I'm not saying we always do it right, if we do it right, the rising tide will lift all boats and will help both parties. But we're not necessarily doing that because it's hard to get all of the product developed as fast as you'd want to. Albeit we have a very, you know, we have a relatively large technology team and very modern technology now, but um, it's still a lot of work to get products built that are customized. Um, Adam, you, just before we started, uh, just before we started on, on air today, you reminded me that actually, um, you and I were recording a, as part of an event there during COVID, so possibly a year, a year and a half ago. And I remember, that actually, it, it, uh, we were actually um, an event that was going out to estate agents up and down the country. So as people were locked down in COVID, um, we, were, we were speaking to the industry, and part of that was a Q&A. And I recall there was, um, there was Q&A, uh, the questions came in, from the audience of estate agents up and down the country. And there was concerns about um, fee increases that they'd gotten from DAFT. And, and there was a conversation starting to happen openly on social media across estate agents in terms of uh, the increase of fees, could these be tolerated, but also some speculation about the future of DAFT and the speculation could DAFT get into the selling homes directly, despite the fact that estate agents are your customers. Um, I, I presume you're you're aware of that kind of online conversation that was happening. Yeah. So um, yeah. So there's two there's two questions there. I think the first is you know value based. Um, so are we giving fair value to the market? Um, and to answer that, I think there's a couple of pieces. But we're looking at our competitors' value versus our value, and our primary commodity that we deliver to agents is leads, be they buyers, be they renters, um, and the volume and the quality of those leads. So that's something we monitor really closely. Um, and there's solutions that where we can track, you know, in partnership with an estate agent, we can track where their leads come from. Um, and we have a, an, 
Dublin-based agent that we're running an experiment with at the moment. And we can see in Dublin, we deliver three times as many leads um, as our nearest competitor. Now, we're not three so times. Three, the, three times as many. Yeah. And, and there's, there's other examples. I mean, our general manager, uh, Jonathan Carter, sold a house recently. Now, it was a super boosted ad on Daft in, in Lucan. And at one point, he'd received 96 leads from Daft and one lead from our nearest competitor. So in those, in those cases, now, that's, a, that's an extreme example. Um, and it's not, it's only one property. So the, the group of properties with this agent were delivering three times as many leads and, and we're not three times the price. Mm -hmm. So I think it's about the value we deliver. And when an agent's making an advertising decision, I think they should look at those metrics. And we're happy to help people with tracking if they want to understand, you know, they can, they can organize it themselves if they want to put a specific number on our site and do the same with my own where they want our help to do it. We use a technology called Iovox. And we'd be more than help, help, happy to help people because I think the marketing managers on the big agencies and then, you know, in the case of a smaller agency, you are the marketing manager, you're everything. You're also the CFO and everything else in between. But understanding where your leads are coming from um, and then making marketing investments around them would be really helpful. And then the second part is that agent commission has come under a lot of pressure as a result of competition in Ireland amongst agents. And, you know, we're looking at international examples of, Plenty of examples where agents earn 5%. In Ireland, there's lots of examples where it's 1%. That's not good. And it's very difficult then for the agent to fund the, the advertising. And as such, we're looking to change how that pricing works and how that model works. And if you take the example of, you know, we're much more affordable than paper advertising, et cetera. But in the, in the, in the state where paper advertising was the primary solution, you know, you no longer need a window on the street. So you don't need a high street location. So we've helped you reduce cost there. The small agent can get access to all of the leads. That's true. But we have a subscription-based model. And if you don't pass that cost successfully on a per unit basis to the vendor, then that's effectively eating into your margin. And if your commission's 1%, that's not necessarily a very, you know, that's the margin's important. So what we're looking to do with our product, and we have a, a, a program called Premier Partner, and what we're looking to do is enable the agents to get their sub down to zero and pass the cost on to the vendor successfully. And I think vendors should be able to make a conscious choice about their DAF marketing. And they should be able to go, I want a featured ad, a premium ad, or a standard ad. Here's the costs. And if we can separate that from, let's call it the agent wallet via their commission, I think we can both work really well here. Um, and we need this engagement from, from estate agents to get the right solution. I'm not saying we've got it right yet. But, you know, I was speaking to an agent last week and she said to me, it's 20 odd years in the business, she said, 20 years ago, I used to charge 700 pounds for advertising. Now, including your signage, including everything, it's actually less than that because, I, you know, I would give it some, you know, she's based in the greater Dublin area in, a, in an expensive area. And she said, I, I would have given somebody an advertising in the independent, et cetera. So I think we're giving better value than we ever gave albeit it's difficult if it's not directly um, transferred to the, the cost isn't directly transferred to the vendor. And if agents, you know, and in some cases, agents compete by saying, I'll give you a premium ad on that for, as part of the package. And then that, that doesn't necessarily help us and it doesn't necessarily help the agents if that's how people are winning business. So um, Adam, it occurs to me that you're, um, you're actually touching on something that is a bigger issue that we have touched on before, but it seems to be, uh, when new estate agents are coming into an area, there's this almost immediate race to the bottom. And it can be difficult for existing agents in, in a town or village to withstand that. But it's so important that they do because this race to the bottom, nobody wins, including the consumer, because the consu there, is, there is no consistency of not just the level of service, but actually you can't stay in business at that level either. So I, I think that um, it was certainly a problem a few years ago and it seemed to get a bit better. And I, I wouldn't like to see us going back to that again, where individual estate agents are engaging in this race to the bottom where they're genuine. It can be no winner, including the consumer, because that's such a big problem. But I suppose, Adam, like within DAF.ie, is there a plan to start selling properties directly? So absolutely not. Um, but I'll, I'll give a little bit of um a background to that and, and how I how I kind of view it or how we view it. You know, one of the ways I frame it is that look, if we can't do it from behind a computer, 
popular in Dublin. Now we're no longer based in Dublin, we're all at home, we're scattered across the country. But um, um but if if we can't do it from behind the computer, we're not interested in doing it. You know, the core, I might be the face of Daft and I, I have some, you know, I, I'm I personally I like spending time talking to people, but a lot, a lot of how we work and what we do is internal and we're we're we de- develop technology. We don't sell houses. We don't have that skill set. It's not in our part of our DNA. We don't have logistical skills to to manage keys and and do viewings or or any of that. It's 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 just so far from our DNA, to be honest, that we would have no interest at any point in entering the market and competing with estate agents. And the other side of that is competing with estate agents. They're you know a really key part of our product. And if we were to, I'm sure very quickly, we would lose a lot of our asset. And it's not like we could win a significant share of business overnight. So I don't think on the commercial side, even if, if, I, if, I, if I did think we could do it successfully, I don't think it would be smart. Um, and as such, we, will, we have no intention as it stands. And I, I couldn't see that changing in the future. Okay, um, and albeit I don't have a twenty-year crystal ball, and I might be retired by then. So <laughs> you, you and me both, Adam. Um, before we finish up on the technology side, what are you most excited about? What's coming down the tracks from your team? Yeah, so I, I'm I'm excited about what I mentioned already on the offer side. I, I think it's going to be dynamically; it'll make agents more efficient. And you, you know, like you mentioned, if if there's a race to the bottom, efficiency tools are going to be important. So that's cool. If estate agents can make less phone calls and still really give the personable approach and approve bidders and do viewings. I think that'd be cool. Um, I think it'd be great to see it on, on Daft or wherever it's housed. Um, and then the other side is, look, we, we're launching a product, an automated valuation machine. You know, again, it's going to be a guesstimate. It's not, you know, if you haven't viewed a property and you're not an estate agent with local knowledge, you're not going to get the valuation right. But it's still a very exciting tool for people. We're seeing, you know, the groups that we've tested with love going on putting in multiple addresses, finding out how much their house is worth, how much their neighbor's house is worth. And then, look, if you're, if you're serious about selling, that can be very helpful for somebody. You know, I'm, I'm, oh, I just saw a beautiful house down the road. You know, it's X thousand. How much equity have I in my own house? And, you know, it'd be fun on a Saturday evening. You can figure out how much that is. But, you know, all the call to actions are, if you're, if you're serious, you should contact an estate agent and get a professional valuation. But, but I think those types of tools online tools that help people. I think what we're doing in mortgages could be very exciting. Again, online tooling, you know, our buying budget, comparison engine, we're looking for at elements of the online application journey now. All of those, I think, could be very exciting for consumers and for agents and bring more efficiency um, into the market. And very good. Very good. We look forward to, to learning more about those. That was Adam Ferguson, Chief Commercial Officer of Daft.ie, part of Distilled. And that's it from us this week. You can get in touch with the show on social media at iProperty Radio or email hello at iPropertyRadio.com. My thanks to producer Breed Malloy and the Hear Me Roar Media production team and to Luke Delaney on sound for Dublin South FM. Until next time, thank you for listening.